So we've had some fantastic presentations so far. Um, we've heard all about a massively successful website in the UK. We've heard about how Airtricity are able to use universal design principles as well. But I think we can all agree that procurement is the most exciting topic that we could possibly talk about today. Um, I just want to, just to get a proper feel for the audience, can you just put up your hand please if you've worked in procurement in a public body? So if you've been involved in procuring something in a public body, just put up your hand. Okay, so that's about, I'd say that's over half the, the room. A few late hands there, people weren't sure. But that's over half the room, I think. So can you just get another show of hands for anybody who's enjoyed procuring in the public service? <laughs> Two hands and a few laughs. Okay, so we have some work here to do, lads. Um, if you want to play along, if you have your phone, laptop, tablet, whatever you have, if you want to look at the document that we're going to be talking about today, there's a shortcut that you can use. It's t9.ie slash procurement. So the letter T, the number 9.ie forward slash procurement. Right, so Section 27 of the Disability Act 2005 is very short but very powerful. It requires the head of a public body to ensure that services provided in good supply to the public body are accessible. I'm just going to go through that bit by bit. First of all, it requires, we often talk to some people in, um, about this sort of thing where they think we're saying it would be a good idea if you did this. A lot of people don't realise that this is actually a, a full legal obligation. The next thing is that it's all services provided and all goods supplied that they have to be accessible to people with disabilities. There are a few exceptions which I'll be talking about later on. Um, if it would not be practicable or if it would be too expensive or if it would cause an unreasonable delay in getting that service available to everybody. So that's the law. So that was 2005. The following year, we produced a code of practice that referred to some parts of the Disability Act. And we kept it fairly brief. Very roughly, we said, include accessibility as a criterion when you're procuring, review all your policies, procedures, templates, and so on, and inform any members of staff whom you need to. So that was all good. We did a bit of monitoring in 2008, and we weren't particularly happy with the results that we got back. Um, most people, that turned, well, a whole lot of people anyway, were not applying what Section 27 of the Disability Act 2005 said. So some of the reasons we got back in the monitoring were around how complex the legislation is, people just not being aware that this was a full legal requirement, or people not being able to judge for themselves whether something was accessible or not. So, we made some phone calls. Um, spent a while making a whole lot of phone calls to a whole lot of people in public bodies. I just wanted to find out, off the record, what's actually <coughs> happening here. Why are people not following what Section 27 says? And people were telling me the, the sort of day-to-day -day problems that they're coming up against when they're doing this. So what we did kind of echoes um, the government digital services uh, fourth design principle, do the hard work to make it simple. We decided we need to make this simple. It's obviously that little bit too difficult for a whole lot of people in public bodies. Public bodies are losing staff. They have more to do with fewer resources. So we need to make this much easier for people to do. If the requirements are a bit complex, it's probably up to us to make them simpler. Also, we needed to make this a whole lot faster because people have less time, we need to make sure that we can just speed this along for people, that people don't have to waste a whole lot of time just starting from scratch and trying to understand this section, trying to look at all the different accessibility requirements, trying to rewrite all of their policies and so on. So if we can make something that people can copy and paste, then we're going to do that. And actually one of the things that we found out on the phone is that one reason that people weren't applying Section 27 of the Disability Act is because people tend to copy and paste what they did last time. So if you have to procure something, and if someone else procured the same thing a couple of years before that, well, if that person didn't go to jail, then your best bet could be to copy and paste it, and then you won't go to jail either. That seemed to be some of the thinking. So we figure if people are going to copy and paste, let's give them something very useful that they can copy and paste from. So we published a document called Procurement and Accessibility. We didn't spend too long thinking up the name. It discusses the legislation quite briefly. It goes into the process in quite a lot of detail, and that's mostly what I'll concentrate on today. And it has a whole lot of copy and pasteable criteria for things like products and services, built environment, and information technology. So one of the first things that we have there is some suggested text for your policy. Your public body probably has a procurement policy. It possibly doesn't mention the Disability Act 2005. It definitely should mention that. 
So we have this down to less than 200 words. It's very straightforward. You can copy and paste it from us, put it into your own procurement policy. That means that your procurement staff will start using that. People who are new to procurement will start using that. You'll be sending this information to suppliers. It means that you'll be able to use text that we are fairly sure is, is completely correct and will help you to apply the Disability Act when you're procuring. So we're making that a, as easy as we possibly can. So in the process itself, the first thing is to, ex to assess the accessibility issues. So include accessibility from the start. As Fiona was saying earlier, that is just much, much easier. You can design something to be fully accessible from the start. That will allow you to save a whole lot of time and money. Later in the process, you might find that it's just too late to make things accessible. Involve customers and colleagues with disabilities where you can. I've been working in the National Disability Authority for five years. Um, I was working web accessibility for a couple of years before that. I cannot predict what customers with disabilities in a particular situation are going to do. Uh, the best thing is to just ask people in a particular situation what exactly they need. It'll just save time and money. The next thing is that procurers and suppliers need to have a better understanding of accessibility. So it's up to us to educate the market. It's up to us to raise the bar. Some suppliers will give you something that they think is accessible. It might not be fully accessible, so it's up to us to, to raise the bar there as well. If your access officer is actively making sure that people with disabilities can access your services and your buildings and your information, then they'll probably be a great source of information. I mentioned the exceptions earlier on. I'm just going to talk about those for a while. So the exceptions, again, are if it's not practicable or too expensive or would cause an unreasonable delay, then it's OK if you don't get something that's fully accessible to people with disabilities. But even if you are in that situation, there's still a whole lot that you can do. This isn't a, a get out of jail free card. So again, and this is a theme that you've seen come up through today, you can consult people with disabilities and find out, well, with this particular thing, what aspects are important and what aspects are a barrier? So for example, if you're hiring a venue for a conference, you need to find out, well, what are the most important things? Is it that there's accessible public transport, that there are accessible parking spaces? Is it that the staff have disability equality training? Is it that the inside of the venue is easy for people to get around? Find out what's particularly important and what could be particularly problematic. Once you have that, go back and tell your suppliers. Again, we need to educate the market. So you go back and tell suppliers, here are the particular problems that you need to work on. We are legally required to get something that is accessible. We might be going with a less than perfect solution this time, but next time we're going to procure something. If one of your competitors has something more accessible, we're going to go with that. Even if you can't get something that's completely accessible, you still have to get the most accessible service that you can, and then tell your customers. If you've done all the work, if you've done everything you possibly can, and you still can't get something that's fully accessible, at least tell people. It's just heartbreaking for me to meet people who are doing a whole lot of work, and then basically not telling people what they're actually doing. The UK government digital service have a great phrase, which is publish, don't send. They tell people about all the different efforts that they're making. Right, and a bit more about exceptions. I'm going to quote Ben. Um, probably should have asked him about this, but I'm going to quote Ben um, with something excellent that he said in an event in March this year. He said, when designing for the public sector, ambition should be sky high. We want to change lives. And damn right we do. That's the perk of working in the public sector, that you get to make the country that you live in better for the people who live in it. So if something is an exception, that doesn't mean that we've less work to do. It means that we have to push harder, we have to educate the market, and make sure that next time around we do get something accessible. Right, so writing a request for tender, that's the next step in the process. If you have an accessibility policy, such as an accessibility information policy or whatever, um, include that in your request for tender, refer to that. If you don't have one, by the way, come to us and, and we'll make sure you can get one. You might want to do quality assurance. You might want to have regular accessibility audits while the building or website or whatever is being created. You might want to do user testing. You might want to do both. You can decide how you're going to make sure that what you get is going to be properly accessible. You want to get evidence from tenderers as well. So you want to make sure that they're able to give you the information that you need to prove that it's accessible. I'm going to talk about tender criteria. This is, I think, the, the real meat of, of most requests for tender. So we learned that there are two types of tender criteria, selection criteria and award criteria. These are set in stone in law, mostly European law. And they're used for different things, and they're going to be phrased differently. And they're for very different purposes. So. The selection criteria are for, le for selecting tenders who can provide the service. That's the nice way to say it. The harsher way to say it is you want to exclude people who can't give you something. In this case, you want to exclude people who haven't proven in the past that they can give you something properly accessible. 
the type of thing that you can look for in a selection criteria is experience or qualifications, as well as things like uh, financial capacity. So for selection criteria, you want to make sure that anybody who you're going to consider who might provide the service for you is somebody who has the capacity to do it. The next thing then, award criteria. The selection criteria are yes or no. These are going to be longer questions. They're going to be how exactly are you going to do this? So things that you will include in your award criteria will be the likes of price, very important, but also methodology. We're going to look at how exactly are you going to give us something and make sure that it is accessible. So what you're going to do here is get people to tell you about the process that they're going to use to create something that is fully accessible. So once you've put out your request for tender with your selection criteria and your award for criteria, you're going to evaluate the tenders when you get them back in. You're going to look at the suitable experience and skills in the selection criteria, the process in the award criteria. You may need to get expert help. It may be someone else in your organization, somebody in another public body, or it might be someone uh, external that you're going to hire. Every so often, you can measure the success of how you're procuring. Periodically, you can review the different procurements. Make sure that you chose the right guidelines or standards for whatever you're getting. Make sure that you evaluate it correctly and check to see if you had enough expertise. We'll hear later on about the complaints process. We have the Director General of the Office of the Ombudsman to tell us about that. So Section 38 is very simple. It basically says customers can complain. Um, make it as easy as possible for customers with disabilities to complain. Have as many different channels of communication available for that. There is a particular airline who sometimes insists on communicating through fax. Um, so we don't do that. I don't think I've ever sent a fax. We want to make sure we have as many different methods of communication as possible. Right, so I'm going to go quite quickly through these slides. Um, chapters 4, 5, and 6 of this publication have a whole lot of selection and award criteria. You can copy and paste those. We've worded all of these very carefully, so we're fairly sure that you can use these quite happily. So in procuring products and services, you'll be looking at things like transport services, security services, hiring an area for an event, something like that. We also have a bonus in here. We have a curriculum for disability equality training. So in a lot of these cases, you'll want to make sure that somebody has had disability equality training before they provide a service to your customers. Chapter 5 goes into built environment projects, including new projects and older projects that are being refurbished. Chapter 6 is the information and communication technology, including websites, advertising, including videos, and anything that's going to be designed or printed for you. Right, um, we've lost the slide here, no bother. Um, that was going to be, <laughs> I wonder was that taken out on purpose, that was going to be your homework slide. Uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, uh, 15 minutes of homework for you, I thought that was fair enough. Um, for 10 minutes, we just want you to chat to your colleagues about what you've learned about this particular document. Tell them about this, particularly any procurement officers, anybody who's involved in that. Just make sure that everybody knows that this is a particular requirement. We'd also like you to take the link to procurement and accessibility and just share it with your colleagues, put it on your internet, email it around, print it out, wherever you think most people will see it. Next thing we want you to do is just copy and paste the policy that I mentioned into your own procurement policy and then two minute job there. We'll have a video of this available um, within a week or so. It'll be on YouTube. Again, you can send that around to colleagues and just let them get up to speed very quickly on this. Thank you very much. <laughs>